Hi there, welcome to Nepi Invest and welcome to the first portfolio and technical update video for 2024. I plan to do these, release these videos every single Sunday for as maybe as long as possible or until you get sick of them. So if you do get sick of these videos, just don't watch them. And if the views dry up to like one person watching, maybe I will stop doing these particular videos. Uh, interesting week in terms of uh, lack of activity on the ASX. And when I say lack of activity, I'm just talking about announcements. And when I say announcements, I don't care about non-market sensitive announcements. I'm talking about price sensitive announcements. There was one day, it seems like only seven price sensitive announcements were released before trading had begun. Now I'm probably exaggerating just a little bit, but it did seem like that. And that's understandable. I did expect this week, the first week of January, to be probably the quietest, quietest week of the year. Um, or second quietest week of the year. Maybe the previous week was quieter. And the main reason behind that is I think every manager and his dog or her dog is away on holidays or still away on holidays. And this is not the time to release price-sensitive announcements, particularly if it's bad announcements, because uh, they are away on holidays. And uh, it's a bad look if the manager is away on holidays and the company releases a bad announcement. Anyway, that's going to change over the next few weeks because January is an important month on the ASX because uh, not only does it lead, is it leading up to February reporting season, it's also quarterly reporting season for those companies who need to release quarterly cash flow reports or appendix 4Cs and 5Bs for mining companies. Uh, we have not seen one released yet, but over the next few weeks, we'll start to see them trickle in slowly. And then by the end of January, uh, particularly the last day of January, we're going to see a plethora of companies on the ASX released their quality um, cash flow report. And to be honest with you, January is one of my favorite months of the year because of that very fact, just behind February and just behind August. And there's obvious reasons why those are my two favorite months on the ASX calendar. Now, I went on a bit of a tangent there because I was going to say, even though it was a relatively quiet week on the ASX. I was not quiet. I was active. In fact, in terms of activity for NEPI Invest, it was probably the most active week I've had for about six months, maybe for a long time, uh, maybe even longer than that. I sold one company, James Hardy. I took profits in that, up 20% or so. And I took positions in five companies. So I'll go, instead of talking about those companies and those positions I've taken, I'll go through a chart of these companies, might even talk about uh, these positions I've taken when I go through the update of my portfolio. So I run three portfolios. Now, I'm not running these portfolios for anyone else except me, but I am running these portfolios for myself. Quality portfolio, a small cap portfolio, and a technical portfolio. Uh, for those who have not heard me describe these portfolios before, Quality is what it says. It is me investing in high quality companies for the long term. So not as active in this portfolio as some of my other portfolios, particularly the technical portfolio. So most of the companies in this portfolio should be high quality. Unfortunately, it is the worst performing of the portfolios, which probably goes against what we get taught that if you just invest in high quality companies, you are going to do fairly well. Now, I am using a different benchmark here because of a suggestion from a view of this channel that maybe I should be using uh, the NDQ, the BetaShares NASDAQ 100 ETF as a benchmark, not for the reasons they subscribe to, but just because I have invested in a few uh, overseas companies, NASDAQ companies. And to be honest with you, there is potential that even though NASDAQ has outperformed every other market in the world over the past 10, 20 years, I think there's potential it's going to outperform the market over the next 10 to 20 years as well. So using that as a benchmark in this quality portfolio is probably the best thing. And so far, I am slightly underperforming the NDQ, not by a lot. When you look at the capital gain, it's fairly even. And the only reason there is a difference between the overall gains or returns between the quality portfolio and the uh, NDQ is because of dividends and also currency gain because I do own companies that are listed on overseas exchanges on the the, the, Dan the um, German, German, Danish and NASDAQ and two companies on the New York Stock Exchange. Anyway, so I 
you can't really be disappointed with the returns of the quality portfolio just yet. And this is only six months into this exercise. Uh, but let's have a look at the performance of my other two portfolios, starting with a small cap portfolio. So this is just me and sort of one of my favorite uh, ways to trade or invest. And that is finding small profitable companies that have the potential to grow significantly over the next decade or even longer. I love finding these small companies. A lot of fund managers don't even know these small companies exist. That's where we as individual investors have an advantage over fund managers. This is why us as individual investors should outperform fund managers and should outperform the market if we do a good job finding these small cap uh, profitable companies. And at this point in time, this particular portfolio is up 16.3%. I am comparing it to the small odds, uh, the XSO, because that's sort of a roughly um, rough comparison. Although the small odds or the XSO, if you do look at the makeup of that or the constituents of that particular uh, indice, index, it's a little bit different than what I describe or define as small caps. When I say small caps, I'm talking about companies with a markup of $50 million or something like that, um, or as large as maybe a few hundred million dollars. Once you're talking about a company with that has a markup of $1 billion, that's not small. That's pretty big. I'd love to own a company outright for $1 billion. Anyway, small cap portfolio up 16.3% compared to the benchmark, up only 2%. Uh, nice dividends as well. So that's nothing... That's not a reason I invest. Uh, that is a little bit different than a lot of investors in Australia who actually only look at the dividends. I prefer companies I own not to have big dividend yields because dividends um, suppress innovation, dividends suppress growth. I'm looking more for capital growth than income. Now, if I'm a retiree, then income is important. But as someone who is working and adding to their portfolio, uh, increasing their portfolio uh, sizes. I want companies that are going to grow their size. Uh, I don't am not looking for dividend paying companies at all. Anyway, so you have to be happy with this, the returns of this portfolio. So let's have a look at the best returning companies here. So Atlas Pearls, Findi. So again, these are pretty small companies. Then we get to Neuro Pharmaceuticals. So that company has a market cap of about two to $3 billion. I first invested in Neuro Pharmaceuticals when they had a market cap of maybe $200 million. So uh, yeah, almost. So I invested in Neuron when the share price was $2.53, something like that. Now it's $24.11. Energy One, Vaisan, Ordinate Group, uh, and Ansarada, Dugtech, Hillgrove. In fact, I'm going to show you some of the charts for these companies, Crisis Corporation, and look at the return so far for the first six months of the uh, financial year, really good return, significantly outperforming any company that I have in my quality portfolio. So again, that's why I like small cap companies. They can significantly outperform uh, bigger companies. But on the flip side, there is a possibility they're going to significantly underperform. So if you look at the worst performing companies in this particular portfolio, we're talking about Vitura down 48.7%. Pointera had a nice week up down 37.5%. Uh, and then Vection Technologies, Select Harvest, that was a bad selection I made a few months ago. XREF, Rectify Technologies, who knows if they're going to uh, be back trading on the ASX, Integrated Research, and LGI, and then Brookside as well. I've had a few questions about Brookside recently as well. Anyway, so the worst performing companies in this particular portfolio significantly uh, underperformed the worst performing companies in the quality. But I take a portfolio approach. A lot of companies here in the list, and eventually some of these companies are going to do really well. And just look at those two best performing companies, Atlas Pearls and Findi. Findi have returned above 100%. Atlas Pearls is at 200%. What is the worst you can do in an individual company? Down 100%. So there is a limit to the downside, but the upside to any of these companies is infinite. Some of these companies could grow uh, 1 million percent over a 10, 20 year period. And that is the reason why uh, some experts tell you just hold uh, companies that are performing forever or try to hold them for as long as possible. Don't always, you don't always have to take profits because you don't get rich by always taking profits. 
Anyway, so happy with the performance of small caps. Now, even though I said just then, you don't always have to take profits. When I'm talking about my technical um, portfolio, I do take profits here regularly. And maybe what I said just before is a complete utter lie because this particular portfolio is maybe not significantly outperforming uh, the small caps. So I have to show you my open and closed positions here. So this particular portfolio is performing really well, up 25.7% uh, compared to the STW, which is up 6.8%. So a different benchmark for all portfolios. So I actively trade this portfolio, actively trade and take profits. Uh, so my aim was if a company share price increases 20, 30%, look to take profits in that company. It has worked well. And if the share price falls by more than 10%, uh, take a loss. Uh, now, that is a new rule I have implemented here. So if we do look at overall positions, best performing company so far has been step one. That is up under up over 100%. I'm still holding that company, still holding step one. Uh, second best performing company is MA Offshore, up 42.8%. I have taken profits in that company twice in the past year. Then we have Bravira, up 37.6%. Uh, Newix, which maybe I took profits there a little bit too quick. Then I've taken profits in Collins Food. People in a quick fire, 20% return there, or 18.1% in a week. Uh, Kogan have taken profits. Uh, so other holdings I have now include Service Stream. But if you look at the worst performing companies, um, so I have made a mistake. Star Entertainment Group, A2 Milk and City Chic had a greater than 10% loss. I want to limit my losses to at most 10%. Uh, that limits your downside. And then if you let your winners run, past 20%, 30%. And if I have a 60 to 70% success rate, this particular strategy should do wonders. So let's have a quick look at the current holdings in this portfolio. So I have made, so I did make one, two, I actually haven't included uh, Domino's Pizza yet. So I have made a couple of trades during the week and put them into this portfolio. Uh, the first one is Money Me, and that has done really well since I bought some shares, up already 14.7%. Domino's Pizza, which I haven't included. I thought I did, but it's not here. I did make a little bit of a trading um, position in that company. I'll show you why when we look at the chart. Uh, so only company that is in the loss right now is email payments. So I am trading email payments right now. So another thing I should also mention is even though I might hold companies in my quality and small cap portfolio, I still will trade those companies. So I have two positions, one in those other two portfolios and also have a trading position. So that is true for email payments and, oh, you know, James Hardy. So I should actually take my profits in James Hardy here as well. So it looks like I should actually, um, should update this as soon as possible. Anyway. Anyway, I'm, not, I'm no big rush, but the, the performance of the portfolio is not going to change much for by uh, me um, updating it right now. Um, it'd be a very slight change. Anyway, on to the technical update part of the video. So I'm going to go through some indices, commodities, bonds. Then I'll go through, I think about 10 companies that I own. Um, and then I'll go through 10 companies that I don't own. So 20 overall individual companies, not only on the ASX, but also some companies that are listed on either the NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange. So let's start with the indices. Now, it's really interesting right now because the XJO almost reached an all-time high recently. So this would have been either Monday or Tuesday. So on Tuesday, the XJO reached a high of 7,632.7. 7,632.7. The next day, the XGO reached a high of 7,627. No, so the high is 7,632.7. 7, now, if we go back to, was it August 2021? July 2021. Let's go back to July 2021. That was your time high. When the SGO got to its all, achieved its all-time high on the 13th, yep, it was the 13th of August, 2021, the high on that day 
was 7,632.8. So let me repeat those two numbers. So the all-time high for the XGO was on the 13th of August, 2021 at 7,632.8. The most recent high for the XGO was 7,632.7. Point one difference. And the reason why, I think, why we didn't see an all-time high is because the traders know that 7,632.8 is the all-time high, and there was a little bit of selling pressure when it got to that high. So let's have a look at, we'll have a look at the five-minute data. Yep, there it is. There's the all-time high. It was reached within the first hour of trading on Tuesday, and then the ceiling came in. There was a little bit of bounce uh, in the afternoon, but got nowhere, not, I wouldn't say nowhere near the high, but it struggled to get near the high. And that is actually weakness. When you see a little bounce and the price of whatever you're looking at does not get back up to the previous high, that is a sign of weakness. And then, of course, on Wednesday, uh, the SEO fell off a cliff in the first 10 minutes and has been going down ever since. Has it reached a bottom? Don't know. So not an all-time high for the SEO, and that means um, the SEO just has, has uh, pulled back from a pretty important resistance level. So 7632.8 is an important resistance level is now being confirmed because of what we saw on a Tuesday, the fourth or whatever it was, second, what was it? The second, the second of January. That was the first training day of the year. Yeah, it reached an all, almost an all-time high on the first training day of the year. That's extraordinary. And then we can see it's pulled back. So if we just look at the weekly chart for the SGI, it's just trading sideways. There's no trend at all. This is just going back to a resistance area. Uh, SGO has struggled to get above this zone. So between about 7,500 and 7,600, it's got into that zone one, two, three, four, five times in the past. And we want to see it break above 7,632.8. Now onto the small cap. You can see this is less, probably less bullish. Even though I wouldn't say XGO is bullish, but this is definitely less bullish. We saw a really nice run in the small ordinaries in Australia and also United States. Look at that. It went from 2,500 uh, at the end of October all the way up to 2,950. So what's that? That's a 400 increase. So 400 divided by, say, 25. So that's a 16% increase in about two months. That's a nice increase in the small odds over a very short period of time. And the main reason behind that is uh, people thinking uh, the Fed in America is going to start uh, decreasing interest rates, although um, Powell has sort of poo-pooed that a little bit. Um, don't get too excited. Anyway, and then we have seen a little bit of sell-off uh, on overseas exchanges. That's why the XSO, particularly in small caps, that's why the XSO has struggled in the last three trading days of the week, down 0.63 on Friday when the XO was only down 0.07. So that means um, the bigger companies did okay on Friday. It was the smaller companies that suffered on Friday. Now let's have a look at the American indices, starting with the NASDAQ. And these are much more bullish, particularly the NASDAQ and Dow Jones. So a little bit of a pullback, but it's just sort of a buy the dip situation probably here. Yeah? Uh, so a nice uptrend for the NASDAQ and DQ. And the Dow Jones looks pretty nice as well. So for those who don't know, industrial average, that's about 30 companies. So there's two Dow Jones, industrial average, and then there's transport average. Um, if you want to learn more about Dow theory, uh, have a look at some technical books. Read technical analysis of stock trends. They talk about Dow theory. So the Dow Jones is after a guy called uh, Dow. And he came up with some rules. He developed the Dow Jones Industrial Average, Dow Jones Transport Average, just to, um, well, technical reasons, really. Yeah, technical reasons. And then someone, after he died, wrote down what he was looking at. So I'm pretty sure his theory came in after he died. I could be wrong on that. I'm not a big um, expert on Dow or the guy. I can't even remember his first name. It's terrible. Anyway, so Dow Jones looks pretty good. So this is 30 companies on the Dow Jones. There's also the transport average as well. Uh, and then to the Russell 2000, which is the smallest 2000 companies, 
in the Russell 3000. And this was looking pretty good. Looked like it was breaking out. And in fact, if you go back to the XSO, XSO was looking like it was breaking out as well. Looks like it was breaking out, uh, getting past the previous two highs, uh, but that breakout failed. And the same thing happened with the Russell 2000. Potential breakout failed, uh, going past the last three highs. Look at that, yeah. Last three highs, going all the way back to 2022. So about uh, 15 to 18 months ago. And then look what happened. Went above that level for a few days and then boy, it's plummeted back down. So a little bit more weakness in the small caps in the last few training days of the week. Now let's have a look at commodities. Gold is looking really interesting. It wants to break out. It is trying to break out. It keeps failing though. Uh, we saw that massive fail back in the start of December. Remember, everyone was really bullish on gold, uh, even though it only broke out for like 10 minutes or something. I'm exaggerating just a little bit. Uh, even about three or four days after the false breakout of gold happened, people on Osby's the call were still talking about the breakout of gold, even though it had failed. Uh, and then it tried to break out above gold again. Uh, gold tried to break up above the resistance zone again, uh, back towards the end of December, and then has pulled back below uh, that 2060 level. So we want to see 2060 broken for an extended period of time to confirm gold is breaking out. Now, the good thing, the pullback we have just seen when it tried to break out again, the pullback, not quite as powerful as the pullback before that. So it looks like gold is in an uptrend. And I think there is a good chance that gold is going to go, I won't say significantly higher from here, but definitely possibly going on a run from here. So I'm a little bit more bullish on gold uh, than I have been in the last few years. Uh, iron ore, iron ore looks brilliant. So, so three-day pullback in iron ore, but beautiful. This is why Fortescue, BHP, Rio have been doing really well. Some of the smaller iron ore players have not done as really well, and they're going to catch up eventually, uh, without doubt. I think some of these companies, Mount Gibson and Fenix, are two of those uh, Juna minor, Juna iron ore producers. I think they are going to have absolutely brilliant half years because if we go look uh the second half of the last half year was a really good for iron ore companies um so iron ore is in an uptrend for some reason don't know uh uranium has been in uptrend for a long time it keeps going up this is the weekly chart the last time iron ore had a down week was it was a very small down week in october it was down 0.27%. And before that, it was in start of October, down 4.93%. This is a beautiful chart. Uh, oil. I did take a trading position in Karoon because oil was getting down to around about $70 or below $70. And you can see uh, over the past year or so, whenever oil gets below about $70, uh, that's the time to have a look at oil companies. And a little bounce, not much of a bounce, but I think the bottom is around between about 68 or six, we'll say 65 and $70. That's the bottom, sort of a buy zone for oil. Um, so if I do see oil go back into that area, I might add to my position in Karoo. Who knows? Uh, lithium keeps dropping. So let's have a look at the weekly. So this is complete opposite to uranium. It keeps dropping. Last time lithium had an up week was way back in June of last year when it was up 11.6%, uh, just keeps on dropping. There's no end in sight to lithium prices. Uh, copper, I've been a little bit bullish on copper, but when you do look at the daily chart for copper, it's just going sideways. It started to look interesting up until the last week or so, um, but it's pulled back a little bit. So not as, as bullish on copper as I am in gold. If I did have silver here, I'd probably be more bullish on silver without doubt. And should I talk about coal? No, it doesn't look interesting. Bitcoin, let's have a look at Bitcoin. Bitcoin's in a beautiful uptrend. Can't deny that. Just got to its long-term high about three or four days ago, which is good. So we want to see high highs, high lows, that sort of thing. And that's definitely true for Bitcoin. And now let's have a look at bonds. So US 30 is up 1.23%, but it has been dropping for a while. Come on, bonds. Oh, a nice little rally. 
gee, there we are. So is this a dead cat bounce? Is this like a false rally in bonds? Or is the bond market spooked by the fact that a pow is less, I wouldn't say he's less keen, less bullish on uh, dropping interest rates, but he's just saying, hold your horses, uh, hold your horses. There's not a certainty we are going to drop rates in the next year. The bond market was saying, yeah, without doubt, you're going to drop rates six times in the next year. And I think there's a chance the bond market was wrong. And that's probably why we are seeing bond um, yields rally, which means a 10-year Australian bond yields rallied as well. But I'm not even sure why I show you both of these. They are a mirror e image of each other. And I won't show you the TLT, which is the bond ETF, because it's the reverse mirror of bonds, because this is bond prices. Don't forget, bond yields and bond prices are inversely related. So when bond yields fell for 30 years, that was a bull market for bonds, because bond yields falling meant bond prices were rising. If you don't understand that, I'll do a video on it. It's actually really easy to explain, but I'm not going to explain it right now because I don't want to waft on. Anyway, you can just see there, bond deal, bond CLT, the, uh, was it, the 20 plus year treasury bond ETF, for that beautiful rally. And that's the same period of time when bond yields were dropping. So again, bond yields, bond prices, inverse related. Now let's have a look at 10 companies I own. Just wanted to show you some charts of these companies. Uh, I look at these charts every single day. Uh, so I don't look at charts every single, I don't look at charts I don't own every single day, but these ones I do if I'm trading them. So companies in my quality portfolio, I might look at those charts once every few weeks. In my small cap portfolio, I might look at those charts once per week. So some of these I will look at every single day, particularly if I am trading them. So let's start off with step one. So this is uh, my best performing company in the trading portfolio. A uh, beautiful breakout back in August, just a classic breakout. Can't remember if they released any positive announcements with that. And not only that, the breakout coincided with massive volume coming in and share price just keeps on rising. And also the company has released a few positive announcements as well. And that will fuel the positive sentiment. So definitely sentiment this company has shifted from negative to positive. I'm also very positive on their underwear. Um, very comfortable underwear. I don't want to sell. I don't get any money from step one, uh, but they do provide really comfortable underwear. And anyway, so beautiful looking chart. And the last positive announcement this company released was on the 18th of December. And the main thing, when I see a company release a positive announcement and the share price pops up like it did for step one, up 11.1%. What I want to see is at least the share price going sideways. I don't want to see the share price plunging because that would tell me that there is an oversupply of, um, well, oversupply uh, versus demand. So it's all about supply demand. Everything's about supply demand. There was a comment in one of my videos talking about lithium. If there's a lot of lithium companies, lithium exploring companies, that means there's going to be an oversupply of lithium. It doesn't work like that. Eventually, if the price of lithium remains suppressed, those lithium explorers will become uranium explorers or gold explorers or copper explorers. There'll be no more lithium uh, explorers listing on the ASX. There'll be uranium explorers, gold explorers, copper explorers, and then lithium producers, not all of them, but some of them will close down their mines, suspend operations. So what happens? The supply of lithium starts to drop. So if demand keeps on rising, eventually there's going to be a match. And then if no more lithium comes on the market and demand keeps on rising, eventually there'll be an over-demand um, of uh, lithium and the lithium prices will start to rise. It's all about supply and demand. Exactly the same when it comes to share or the charts or share prices. You want to see what's happening with supply and demand. If you see share price pop up on a positive announcement and then share price pull back significantly, that means there was a lot of selling a lot of supply of shares on the market, and there was enough demand to meet that supply. What we have seen with step one over the past two to three weeks since they released that positive announcement, share price going sideways, which is good. Also on decreasing volume, which is probably understandable this time of year, which is good. That means there's no selling or very little selling. And there's a better chance the share price will go up from here. Hillgrove Resources. So this is a company, a copper company, 
that will be going to production soon, if not already. So this was, I bought this uh, quite a few, forget exactly when, it was actually quite a bit ago. You can see how volatile sh share price of this company has been. So I think one of the reasons why the share price of this company is running up is just because they're going into production. Uh, so share price of Hillgrove Resources is increasing from 5.4 cents at a recent low to a current share price of 9.3 cents. That's a nice increase. And we are starting to see a little bit higher volume. So it's all about the company going into production. And this is a nice looking chart. So the breakout, I'll just show you the breakout of this. If you were looking for a breakout, there it is. And why is that a breakout? We had the high in January of 2023, and the share price struggled to get about that high in July. And then just look at what happened. Share price on the 6th of December got through. You can see a one-day candlestick here where share price went to 7.9 cents, and then the selling came in, sent the share price down to around about right on this line. And then over the next five days, the share price was just, just straddling that line. And that means there's um, there's traders who know that this is a resistance zone and they're getting out. But there's also those longer term investors who know Hillgrove is going to go into production. They're more keen to buy some shares in this company. So there was extra demand for shares in this company. And then eventually all those traders got out of the picture, but the demand for shares remained. And that's why the share price just started increasing because demand supply. It's all about demand supply. Okay. Uh, Drop Suite is another company I own in my small cap. So step one, trading. Hillgrove in my small cap. Drop Suite is in my small cap. I did own this company for a long time. In fact, I bought Drop Suite because they were trading in this range between about 16 cents and 25 cents. And when I saw the share price get to the bottom of this range, I decided to take a position. It was a company I've been following for a long time. I do like the management of Drop Suite. And the share price just by blind luck, that was this bottom here in December, 2022. And then the share price went on a beautiful run. I took the profits, not the top here. When you saw this massive down day, I took profits either then or the next day and I bought back in. So I decided to buy back in because I'm still impressed with the company. And this is just a situation where I just want to own shares in this company. I don't care. If the share price fell a little bit further, maybe I'd add to my position, but the share price has gone on the run for some reason. I don't know why share price is starting to increase. Well, that's wrong. It's again, demand supply. There's more demand for shares than supply. So maybe people owning this company right now, shareholders just don't want to sell. That sometimes does happen. There's no trading or very little trading in this company. So day traders are on in this. Um, even short-term traders aren't in this because there's not a lot of volatility over the past five or six months, not a lot of volume either. So this share price is just running up because of a little bit increase in demand. Okay, Money Me, this is an interesting one. So I have decided to take a position in Money Me, a training position. Uh, this is not based, I'm just going to ignore the longer term ribbon because the share price of this company has just dropped like a rock. It's gone from about $2.40 all the way down. I'll get rid of this two. So this is more just looking at the shorter term moving averages here, which is the 25 to 50 day moving average channel. And it's gone from red to green, which means this shorter term sentiment, we'll say medium term sentiment in this company has shifted and the share price has gone on a run. Uh, and the most important thing when it comes to money me is uh, last time the share price went a little bit of a run back in September, share price got to about 8.5 cents and then pulled back. So we what we wanted to see was the share price get above 8.5 cents on pretty good strength. And that happened on Friday. I took a position in this company, I think it was 8 cents. If I remember correctly, it was 8 cents. I can actually tell you right now. Click on money me. I took a position in this company on the 3rd of January at 8 cents. Yeah. So 3rd of January was this day here. So this was me. I've done this in the past. It doesn't always work, but this is me thinking the share price will break out soonish. Sometimes it doesn't. So this can be a sort of a risky play, but this was just me thinking there is a shift in sentiment in this company. Uh, the trend is trying to shift, and I think the share price will break out 
And I was a little bit shocked that it only took two days after I bought the share price possibly had broken out on the Friday. Share price of MoneyMe up 8.2% to 9.2 uh, cents. What I want to see is a share price will remain above 8.5 cents. If we do see some selling coming in, and the reason why selling would come in, and this is pretty easy to explain, just look at the long-term chart for Money Me. Share price has been as high as, was it $2.40 back in, maybe even higher than that, two, two, yeah, $2.50 almost back in July 2021. So there are a lot of shareholders in this company that are underwater. That's resistance. That supply of shares on the market. What we want to see is that extra supply of shares on the market being met by demand. Um, best way to increase demand of shares in a company to meet that extra supply is for the company to release a really positive financial statement. I'm not sure if Money Me can do that. I'm skeptical, skeptical they can do that. This is just the market knowing that this company, and there's many companies like this, a fintech company, they, they're a lender. I think like a SME lender, that sort of thing. The market knows that if interest, rate, if interest rates start to fall, this company will benefit from it. So the market is forward looking right now. And that's why Money Me is going on a run just like Zip is on a run. Uh, so I have bought trading positions in both. Another trading position I have uh, bought into is Domino's with a little, little pullback. So I own Domino's in my um, high quality portfolio, but there was a breakout in Domino's pizza share price on the 14th of December. You can see share price going sideways, really struggling and getting about $55. And then on that date, 14th of December, what happened that day? Look at it. Share price rose 4.3% on that day. I would have preferred some higher volume or bit more volume coming in. And then over the next two days, the share price fell back to $55, tested that area and then took off. Now we have seen with overall weakness in the market, share price of Domino's Pizza has come and is now testing that level again. Now, possibly the share price will fall below $55. If it does, then I will just set out this trading position and maintain my longer term position. But I'm thinking this could be just a little bit of a bit of a, um, a dip. And then we'll see the share price continue to go up. Now, very important, Domino's Pizza possibly will release a trading update in the next few weeks. I'm just saying it's a possibility. I think quite a few companies will release training updates because they will, management of companies will have an idea of how they performed in December. December and yeah, December is probably the most important month for a lot of retail companies. And Domino's Pizza maybe not fits, doesn't really fit into uh, like a step one, that sort of uh, retail company. But this company uh, might have an idea of how they perform during the holiday season. I'm not sure if Domino's Pizza is as seasonal, but I think there there's probably is a bit of seasonality to Domino's. And uh, if they do release a positive trading update, you will see the share price take off. Oh, no, whoa, this is a mistake. PPE. I do not own this company anymore. I'm not sure why I included people in. I did take profits. So I bought, this was just, uh, this is also, well, it's not really a risky. So at $1, so round numbers tend to be really strong resistance and support levels. So all because of the psychology of the investor. Investors, for some reason, love round numbers. I don't know why. I prefer non-round numbers. And $1 for people in was a really strong resistance or support level, I think. Yeah, actually, it is. Yeah. So let's go back. I remember now. Go back to the COVID-19 financial panic. What did the share price get to in that worst week around the March of 23rd? It got down to about $1 and then it bounced. Look at that. It's perfect. And now we are seeing it bounce in people in. Traders know this. Uh, even tr some traders have long-term memory. Well, I wouldn't say long-term memories, but they remember that people in low during the COVID-19 financial panic was $1. It was a little bit wet, less than $1, but the low in that week was exactly... 99 cents. It got as low as 90 cents, but it was 99 cents. And now what do we see? $1 hit again and then a bounce. So I bought on either the 11th of December or the 12th. I can't remember what, because I bought at 99 cents. And then I sold when the share price got to like $1.20 within a week, less than a week, a 20% um, gain in less than a week. I'm going to take that. 
and the share price is going sideways. So I'm undecided about which way people in share price is going to go from here. We are seeing a really big dip in volume. The other thing, the other reason, the other really good signal is the volume. When it got down to $1, look at that massive volume coming in. That's another really good sign that the bottom is being reached. Now the volume is drying up. Wouldn't be surprised to see if people in share price got back to $1. If the share price of this company gets back to $1, I will take a trading position again, expecting a bounce. And if the bounce doesn't happen, just sell at a small loss. Okay, so a few purchases I made during the week. Did I include all in here? So Money Me, Objective, Domino's Pizza, Demerix, and Cosol. Yes, they're all here. Uh, so Objective. So this is a company I've wanted to own for a while. Uh, and I was just waiting for the share price to fall lower. I would would have loved to see the share price drop below $10. That was my buy-in price. It got as low as about $10.20. So maybe I should have just taken a position at $10.20, not be too picky. But it did look like the share price was trying to go on a run. And then we saw the share price pull back. So I'm hoping this is a pullback and the share price will go on a run. Uh, so even though the P ratio of this company is 56, there's reason behind that. If you look at the financial performance of Objective last year, so revenue, flat, profit, flat, up a little bit. I do expect revenue and profit growth to significantly increase from here. Now, I did not buy a massive uh, position in Objective just because of the possibility the share price pulled back further. And if the share price does pull back further, I will add to my position. So any company that I have in my quality portfolio I am willing to add to that position if the share price falls. I'm not willing to do that for companies in my small cap portfolio, uh, mostly. And definitely not willing to do that in companies in my technical portfolio because if the share price falls, I'm going to take the loss. Now, when I say I don't usually add to my position in companies in a small cap if the share price drops, it's not always true. And for demerics, this is not always true. Now, this is a lesson learned from me. So the share price of this company broke out in early October. They released a really good announcement. Share price increased 154% on the 5th and increased another 20% almost on the 6th. Markup of this company is still just above $100 million. Now, I, I, I like the announcement that saw the share price rally. And then I saw the share price was really struggling to get below 13 cents. So it's a really nice support level. And I just wish I bit the bullet. I was thinking of taking a position in this company at 13 cents. Uh, it didn't happen. And I would have been, I would have doubled my money because the share price has taken off. So this won't say it looks similar to Neuron Pharmaceuticals. Neuron Pharmaceuticals was, won't say that was a one-off, but this is almost a similar story to Neuron Pharmaceuticals. And the Neuron Pharmaceuticals story had a long time to play out. I'm not talking about 10 years. I started following Neuron Pharmaceuticals back in 2012 or 2013. It took about 10 years for that story to play out. But when I bought a position in Neuron Pharmaceuticals to fully play out to where it is now, it took about two years. I think Demerix is going to be a little bit shorter than that because they will be starting to make money very soon, if not already. Uh, Neuron Pharmaceuticals, you had to wait a little bit of time. Uh, I think there is value in this company at $100 million. So I have taken a small position in Demerix. And this is one of the most favorite companies among the viewers of the channel, by the way, uh, just behind Aroa Biosurgery. So what I've done is I've taken a small position. If the share price drops, and what I'm looking for here is a below 20 cents, uh, about, say, 19 and 20 cents. If the share price falls to 19 to 20 cents, currently 23.5, I will add to my position, expecting the share price to go higher. If the share price keeps going higher from here, well, hmm, I'll be happy with that. Uh, even though I won't have added to my position, I don't think the share price will get down to 13 cents. Uh, too much strength in the chart right now. Uh, and there is too much positive sentiment behind this company. Cosol, the more I do research on Cosol, the more I do like it. And this was, even though I put Cosol into my uh, small cap portfolio, this was more of a trade because I saw the share price break out above this little resistance zone at about 91 cents. You can see the share price of the Cosol was struggling to get above this level since the start of 2023. 
Uh, you could have bought Coso as low as 68 cents back in June, but then all of a sudden it just broke out above uh, 91 cents on the 22nd of December. And we have seen a little bit of a pullback. So again, this is just me taking advantage of a nice little pullback in the share price. Uh, I do like this company. There are some questions I do have about Coso, particularly with the margins. I probably would have expected higher margins, but uh, market cap is only $168 million, dividend yield 2.55%, price earnings ratio 19 at this point in time, and really nice growth in revenue. Uh, revenue has increased from $11.7 million to $75 million in the last four years, and profit has increased from $1.5 million to $8 million in the last four years. And I think there is possible for some really good growth in this company. Uh, and this was just a breakout. I've done this before for quite a few companies in my small cap portfolio. I will buy on a breakout. So it's more of a trading decision. But then I decided to put it in my small cap portfolio because I actually do like the company. And it was just seeing a breakout of a company I like. I'm going to take a position in that company. I didn't do that with Vison. So this is the last company I'm going to show you of companies I own, except people you know, I've actually sold that. This is me just doing a little bit of research on this company, liking what they do, seeing the share price was in a beautiful uptrend. This was a beautiful uptrend from April all the way through to September. So we're talking about a five-month period when the share price went from $0.10 cents to $0.20. Cents. It doubled in that five-month period. So whenever you see a share price doubling like that, it's very healthy for the share price to go sideways. That's exactly what happened. So I held all the way through this. And then for some reason, don't know why, share price took off uh, in November. Look at that, share price went from 18 cents all the way up to 28 cents and the share price keeps on increasing. Not sure what has caused this increased interest in Vaisan. I'm just gonna like it. I just like it, just liking it. And there is the longer term, I forgot to put that back in. And there's the longer term trend. So this is a beautiful uptrend uh, right now for Vaisan, uh, mark up $120 million. And just like um, Coastal, beautiful increase in revenue. That's one of the first things I look at is increase in revenue. I want to see increase in revenue. For Vaisan, $11.9 million, up to $65 million in the last uh, four years. Not as profitable as Kosol, only $4 million of profit, but this company is growing. Now, in saying that, if any of these companies that own my small cap portfolio that release a really bad uh, report in February, uh, financial report in February, that could be the end of their uptrends. That's all it takes. Okay, let's go have a look at my A looks. So these are companies I don't own, but I am looking at them closely for possible buyers in the future. For instance, ALQ or AOS has been on this uh, list or this watch list for a while because of a positive announcement on the 15th of November. So this was a while ago. Share price actually has increased from that. That should have been, that was a possible uh, buying a possible, well, that was a potential buying the breakout. Wasn't a classic breakout because the share price was higher back in May, first half of the year. Uh, if the share price uh, was not a high position in the first half of 2023, this would have been a classic breakout. The reason why it's not a classic breakout is because a lot of shareholders bought above or in this area in the first half of 2023. And that's resistance. And that's why, even though share price is rising, uh, there is a little bit of resistance, a little bit of selling coming in. But there's enough demand at this point in time to at least the share price doesn't fall like a rock, unlike some companies. For instance, another company that released, was Tab, is it Tabcorp? I think Tabcorp, or Tabcorp, Tabcorp released a pretty good announcement. The market liked it. So on this day, the share price, 18th of December, share price rose 23.1%. Now beware, when you see share price rise like this, when only it's it's like a two-month high in the share price, almost exactly two-month high, a lot of resistance moving forward. And that's why after the day, share price has just kept on dropping. It's dropped, 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 dropped. Because all that resists, all these shareholders who bought at high prices are wanting to sell and there's not enough demand. So really good volume on that day. That volume has dried up, not enough demand. There's too much supply. Share price is dropping. Share price has dropped from 90 cents to 78 cents. It may not seem a lot, but percentage-wise, that is actually a lot. It's like 15%. Uh, Texas Convenience Retail. So again, this probably would be a proxy for bonds. 
So bond yields rising or falling, or the TLT. This will be a really good proxy for the TLT. So bond yields dropping, share price of DEX's convenience retail rising. Bond yields have been rising. Share price of DEX's convenience retail REIT has been dropping. So I suppose REITs are probably good bond proxies or something like that. I don't know. Anyway, so I think this is trading at a significant discount to NTA. I do prefer these sort of REITs, uh, health REITs, um, storage REITs, all those oh, industrial REITs. Definitely prefer those over office REITs, retail REITs. Uh, so Dexas Convenience Retail is one of the REITs, probably the only REIT I'm following, and I don't include Goodman Group in that. For some reason, I'm following Bristol Myers Squibb Company. And the main reason is because of the valuation. It does look cheap at a P ratio of 13.2. Uh, dividend yield of 4.6 is quite impressive for a company listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and the other reason was, I think I put onto this list, is the share price got to about $48. So if we look at the weekly chart for Bristol Myers Squibb, we can see in the past the share price during the COVID-19 financial panic got down to these levels. Now, if you go even further back, uh, this has been a long-term sort of support level going all the way back to 2013. Uh, so even though the company is growing, the company is growing, the P ratio has been dropping. So financial expansion at the same time as multiple contraction. So that's why uh, the share price is going sideways, even though, show, even though the company is improving their numbers. I think they're improving their numbers. Uh, Disney. Um, I'm a, I'm a Disney subscriber. There are shows on Disney I watch. Uh, I like 24, Lost, so that sort of thing. I'm a big The Office fan as well. It's not on Disney. That is on Amazon Prime. Anyway, um, I'm not the biggest fan of uh, Marvel movies, um, uh, Pixel. I don't, they're okay movies, but I tend to watch uh, TV shows on loops more than movies on loops. I don't know why. Uh, I used to be the complete opposite uh, going back 20, 30 years ago, but now it's just TV shows are superior to movies, just in my opinion. Uh, anyway, uh, I have been waiting for a shift in sentiment in Walt Disney Company, and I think there is potential. We are starting to see the first signs of a shift in sentiment, uh, really negative sentiment in this company going back for a while. And just yeah, the share price uh, started to, back in November. We did see a little, nice little rally, but not a lot of selling came in. Why am I saying not a lot of selling? Look at the last two times we've seen significant rallies. So back in July 2022 and then in January 2023, we saw really good rallies. And then the share price sort of like a reverse V-shaped recovery. So like a reverse of what we saw during the COVID-19 financial panic. This is sort of like a um, like um, the Matterhorn, <laughs> uh, like a mountain. So up and then straight back down, up straight back down what's happening here look this is all about pattern recognition pattern recognition is really important so nice little rally not as impressive as those other rallies but nice little rally some good volume coming in as well but we haven't seen that um share price going back down to the bottom of the what do you call it the bottom of the mountain it's sort of going not quite sideways i would prefer it going sideways but we're not seeing a lot of selling. The reason why it's not dropping is there's not a lot of selling. And the main reason there's not a lot of selling is most likely all those traders or all those investors who bought at much higher prices in the past have already sold out. So there's not a lot of supply compared to demand. And all this company has to do is release a good financial statement uh, announcement. And if the share price can get above, say, $98, that would be all systems go for Disney or Walt Disney Company. Uh, Atlassian. So I took a position in Snowflake and I was thinking of taking a position in Atlassian and I was just waiting for a little bit of a pullback. We had that pullback and then we've seen share price rally the last two days. So I should have been following this company a little bit more closely. You can see a beautiful breakout in Atlassian on, or in the middle of December and the share price went up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, nine out of 10 days went from $186 to $248. And then we had the, you know, what you 
should expect a little pullback. And possibly the pullback has come to an end. I would have preferred the pullback go all the way back down to this dashed line, which is the old resistance zone or resistance area, uh, just to test it. And that would mean uh, that resistance or old resistance zone or area has now become support. Uh, Atlassian. Mark at 58 billion. I was wondering if this is the biggest Australian car. I'm still disappointed that Alaskan didn't list on the ASX. Oh, yeah. I did a standalone video on DGL and I have put DGL onto my ALOX. I'm just following this company, waiting for a breakout because I do think there is potential. This company is cheap. And if they release a positive financial announcement and the share price breaks out, and I probably should say, if they release a financial or positive financial uh, announcement, say a trading update, that sort of thing, the share price will break out. It's sending itself to break out. Share price is going sideways, consolidating. So all the selling has come to an end, but there's not a lot of demand either. So there's probably a lot of people like me just waiting, just being patient, waiting to see um, the next uh, set of results for DGL Group. It does look cheap. P ratio of 12.5 and other valuation metrics are much lower than that. Um, ABY, this is um, Adore Beauty, that's right, Adore Beauty. Not the sort of company I would buy. And to be honest with you, I probably wouldn't trade this either. But this is a fairly similar pattern, what I'm looking for all the time. Share price been a long-term downtrend. Downtrend coming to an end, shift in sentiment, company releases some positive announcements, that sort of thing. Share price breaking out, getting to at least a six-month high, if not one-year high. A little bit of a pullback after a nice little rally. Pullback has come to an end, that sort of thing. A beautiful looking chart. We need to see the share price get higher than $1.40. We need to see, see it get to about $1.50. So if you do like a door beauty, I think now's the time to think about either adding to position if you're a shareholder or maybe trading a door beauty. A much higher quality company, Fisher & Paykel. So I'm always willing to trade these high quality companies. I don't own Fisher & Paykel for the long term. I'm not sure if I ever will. But I definitely will trade these companies, these high quality companies. Um, well, I'm not sure if I would define, yeah, I would define Fisher and Paykel more than likely a high quality company, uh, but not the sort of company I want to own for the long term. Um, anyway, so this is what I am looking for, maybe. Uh, not quite there. And the main reason it's not quite there is last time, the share price is going sideways. And the reason the share price is going sideways it goes back uh, between May and July this year. Share price was in this range. So a lot of shareholders bought at these prices. Uh, so this, the way to say this, this has the makings of a future um, developing uptrend. If we do see the share price start to go up a little bit uh, over the next, say, three months or so uh, and get a higher, actually, I'll just put a line there. What I'm, you see, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about here. So look at that share price high on the 15th of December. Uh, share price got to about $23 or so. And the highs we saw back in July were about $23. So if the share price gets above $23, uh, that would be good good um, for, that would be good sign, bullish sign. That's what I was looking for, a bullish sign. And the reason that would be bullish sign, say if it happened now, say the middle of January, the last time the share price was that high was back in May. So we would be talking about at least a six-month high in the share price. I do prefer at least a one-year high in the share price, uh, but this would be a possible breakout. So keep an eye on Fisher & Pyga for a possible breakout, uh, just like DGL Group. But I think this could play out uh, quicker than DGL. Wouldn't be surprised to see DGL share price just go sideways for like a year. Seen that before. Another company listed on the um, New York Stock Exchange, yeah, Cloudfair. This is a classic. Actually, I've got the, I'm going to put a new line in there. So this is a classic share price breaking out. So share price had a trouble getting above $76. Uh, got close to it a couple of times and then broke out on the 30th, 29th of November and then kept on going up. And then we saw the share price pull back to $76. It's right on $76 right now. $76.28. So this is a potential breakout 
and the potential testing the old resistance level, now support level. And if the share price starts going up, that would be confirmation. This was just a test and the share price could move back up higher than $86. So I want to see $86 breached, but I think uh, market cap $25.6 billion. So this is a um, cybersecurity company. Pretty sure they are cybersecurity, clown fan. Cloud-based services to secure websites, uh, blah, blah, blah. Doo, doo, doo. Cloud fair for developers. It's not. I'm getting it mixed up with another company, I think. Anyway, so this is uh, the sort of thing I'm always looking for, breakouts, then testing of breakouts or testing of uh, support levels, that sort of thing. And the last company is Wiser. Spelt W I. SR, not W-I-Z-R. Uh, it's a different company, I think. Anyway, look at this chart. So long-term downtrend. This is also FinTech. Pretty sure this is FinTech. What are they, what was Wiser? I'm pretty sure they lend. They're a lender. Operates commercial finance market, provides personal loans, financial products, and credit comparison services. Yeah, so just like Money Meme, uh, Prosper, uh, ResiMac, uh, Plenty. There's actually quite a few companies like this. And we're starting to see the same thing in all these companies. And Wiser share price has just taken off the last few weeks. On the 20th of December, share price increased 52% and has continued to climb higher from there. So massive volume coming in that day. Now, when you see spikes, one day spikes like that, it was more than likely just a block trade, something like that. But this wouldn't necessarily say this is a classic breakout uh classic breakout pattern because I do like to see a share price at least consolidating for a period of time. Share price had reached its all-time low, I think all-time low, on the 5th of December. Uh, so you don't want to see the all-time low very close to the breakout. You want to see a little bit further back, but you can't ignore the power uh, in this chart, a really bullish um, takeoff in the share price over the past few weeks and some high volume coming in if you exclude that one day uh, candlestick, that one not the one day candlestick, the one day volume here, uh, huge volume coming in, 100 million shares. That's ridiculous. It must have been a cross trade or something. Uh, anyway, so if you look at the long term chart for Wiser, actually, let's have a look at the weekly chart. Share price of this company is now at four point five cents. Share price of Wiser has been as high as thirty four cents. Not quite an all time low. All time low was back in 2016. But definitely, maybe this is the bottom for Wiser. Maybe. Anyway, that's all I have for this particular portfolio and technical update. If you have any questions, any thoughts, just leave those in the comment section of this video. Otherwise, I'm not a financial advisor. If you do need financial advice, make sure you seek out someone who's qualified and can speak to your own financial needs. That's it for this video. Have a good day. Bye.